What's pumping my creams? Woo-woo. I'm Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards, the podcast where we tell you everything you don't know about the very worst people in all of history. My guests today, the inimitable, the unstoppable, the dynamic duo, sexier than Obama, deadlier than Osama, Cody Johnston and Katie Stoll. This is the best intro I've oh, ever wow. had. Wow, yeah. I really worked on that one. Thank you I, so much. I loved every second of it. Mm-hmm. Also, you could have just said Obama for the second one and it would have worked. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I appreciate you went to the extreme. I did, I did, I did. I always like comparing my guests to famous terrorists. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it felt right. It goes, it goes well every time. How are y'all doing today? Great. Great, absolutely also excellent. Great. Yeah, we uh we do have of course our coffee mate in the mm-hmm. uh, in the room with us. One pump, one cream. One pump, one cream. Uh, it expired in January 2019. Mm-hmm. Delicious. So that's, cool. that's very cool. I do have a uh, because I throw things now uh-huh. on the air because I've become a prima donna. Mm-hmm. Uh, this time it is uh, a loaf of Izio Artisan Bakery San Francisco style sourdough. Delicious. So I okay. will be throwing this in anger. At several points I today. do think that uh, Coffee Mate might have curdled by now, but it might make a good spread for the sourdough. Oh, that's a good idea, just, Katie. Just mm. putting that out there. And if I wanted one cream mm-hmm. spread on the sourdough, how many mm. pumps would that be, do you think? Uh, uh, one. One, be pump, one pump. One pump is one cream. For Honestly, one cream. though, it's so like old now and curdled, it might need two or three <laughs> pumps. You know, pumps. At like, least to get it started. Yeah. Speaking of getting it started, <clears throat> you guys hear about that border militia we did that, yeah. uh, Super that, did. that, that apprehended hundreds of migrants mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. at gunpoint yeah you want to hear the whole history of civilian border militias I really do oh I thought we were just going to hang out <laughs> no. okay no. okay okay that's no. what I told Cody to get him here mm-hmm. but but when the coffee mates every on time. the table it's working yeah. time <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's Can't what get those everybody pumps says going. gotta get those pumps and the equal number of creams, mm-hmm. ideally. Mm-hmm. We should get new coffee made. X pump <laughs> is X cream. X pump is X Except X-cream. that clearly nobody wants to use it. So no, no, I don't know disgusting. if you do need any more cream. Yeah, it's only no. a prop now. <laughs> it's just a prop. It's it's ambient mm-hmm. cream. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's get into it. So, uh, when I was a little kid, growing up in Texas, I learned about the glorious war my white ancestors had fought against the brutal Mexican government and the evil cross-dressing Santa Ana. There was a lot I did not learn, though, like that the Texas revolutionaries had been fighting for their right to own human beings, and that Santa Ana was one of the founding fathers of cockfighting. I did, however, learn a lot about the Alamo. (laughs) <laughs> from there, my Texas history course went from the uh, short-lived and incompetently led Republic of Texas to the Civil War, and that's basically it. I don't remember learning much about Texas in the 1920s or anything about the border aside from some hagiographic tales of the very first Texas Rangers. Now, in case you don't know, the Texas Rangers are basically the Lone Star State's FBI, only with more spin-kicking. See the documentary Walker, Texas Ranger for more information <laughs> on the Rangers and their current incarnation. I did not, however, learn much about what the Rangers had gotten up to pre- and post-Civil War war days. Uh, according to Kelly Hernandez, author of Migra, A History of the U.S. Border Patrol, quote, they battled indigenous groups for dominance in the region, chased down runaway slaves who struck for freedom deep within Mexico, and settled scores with anyone who challenged the Anglo-American project in Texas. The Rangers proved particularly useful in helping Anglo-American landholders win favorable settlements of land win labor disputes with Texas Mexicans. Whatever the task, however, raw physical violence was the Rangers' principal strategy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So okay, cool, yeah, very that's, cool. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Raw physical violence. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. the art of the raw physical violence. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. just just shooting people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now I found that quote and several others in a wonderful Intercept article that makes it very clear just how much unchecked violence was key to early Border Patrol strategies. Because the Texas Rangers evolved from a force bent on maintaining white dominance in Texas to, in the early 1900s, this nation's first real Border Patrol. Here's the Intercept quote. The early years of the 20th century, from 1910 to 1920, were particularly bloody, with hundreds of Mexicans murdered and lynched in the Texas borderlands. The dead included women and children, the aged and the young, longtime residents and recent arrivals, says the Refusing to Forget Project, an initiative started by a collective of border-based historians and researchers. They were killed by strangers, by neighbors, by vigilantes, and at the hands of local law enforcement officers and the Texas Rangers. Some were summarily executed after being taken captive or shot under the flimsy pretext of trying to escape. Some were left in the open to rot, others desecrated by being burnt, decapitated, or tortured by means such as having beer bottles rammed in their mouths. So that's the start of Border Patrol. Uh, what if we didn't do any of that? <laughs> what what if, like, what if what if somebody looked at that and was like, that, we shouldn't allow that. Well, but then you wouldn't be a country. Uh, mm, 
Um, I, okay, okay, but what if a fuzzy if, definition of country here? What if we, you could though? That, that's just all I'm, all I'm saying is what if you could that, be a country and not do that? Sounds like some pie in the sky leftist woo woo comedy thinking. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Keep dreaming, Cody. Okay, but imagine. Okay, all right. No, you're right. Yes, yeah, too lofty. Imagine Sorry. all the people not torturing not migrants <laughs> with beer bottles rammed in their mouths. Uh, I want to imagine not that though. I, what if I? What if? What if not that? What? What if not that? What if um, laws? <laughs> what if not that? What if laws? This is poetic. But they broke the law by crossing a, an imaginary line. They had to come. If they didn't mm. want a beer bottle rammed in them, they shouldn't have come here. Yeah. That's true, and then by like just by virtue of being here, they're they're criminals. Listen, yeah, they're they illegal, didn't uh, human beings that are illegal. Yeah. They I, would, didn't... I mean, do we even want to say human beings? Like, with these people doing no. this, no. probably yeah, yeah. use that word when you when you when you refer to them as human beings. That makes me bread throwing angry. Mm-hmm. Don't oh, okay. take it back, Cody. No, um, I'm not actually going to listen. Okay, yeah, if yeah, they yeah, didn't, yeah. if they didn't want these things to happen to them, then they shouldn't come here. We don't want to do it. This is deterrent. Oh, it's a, it's a deterrent beer bottle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. This is an example, Yeah. so you know what you're getting. Yeah. I hate it. Did it work? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, oh okay. I, I did a, a paper tapping yeah, 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 gesture, I'm not sure if the sound which, which got does not in any way translate to the audio format that we work exclusively in. But it was very comedic in the room. Mm-hmm. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm glad it worked in the room. In the Roaring Twenties, inequality soared while an oppressive drug prohibition state led to outbursts of violent crime across the United States. Mm. By 1924, some Americans had decided that the cause of their problems were all the goddamn immigrants. Mm. We've talked a bit about this a little in other episodes. The second KKK made halting immigration a keystone of its politics, although they were mostly focused on stopping immigrants from the bad parts of Europe. But down south, in Texas, many Americans decided the problem was Mexican immigrants. The need for Mexican farm labor meant that no real restrictions were put in place on immigration, but the government created the Border Patrol as a salve to people who wanted something done. I capitalized the S in something. I heard that with the, with the way you inflected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why? Yeah. Because they wanted something done. <laughs> that's, that's why. Yeah. But people, racists in Texas were like, I don't want these Mexicans coming in. And the agribusiness companies were like, we can't harvest food without them. So we're not going to, like, we're going to lobby the government to not restrict them from coming in. And racists were like, but that makes me angry. So the the government was like, have, have border patrol. <laughs> that's where they come from. <sighs> and now... Wow. Yeah! I toss the bread. There goes the bread that there. also says eat more toast on it. You know what I'm noticing right now is an issue with my toss and bread today? It doesn't bounce back. No, like no. the bagel, the bagels would mm-hmm. pop right back to me. You and I could, go I get could boomerang. Yeah. You, you I'm need to test to, run Well, I'm going to have to have Dan will go get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you, That's Dan. some extra work for somebody. For somebody. Yeah, yeah. Because I am a... Diva. Prima donna. Yeah, diva. Yeah. Um, Like Beyonce. Mm-hmm. A queen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have taken that on myself. Oh, no, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll keep throwing the bread. Yeah, the You're going to get the bagels? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's continue while he grabs my toss and bagels. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the early Border Patrol was very much cut from the cloth of the Texas Rangers. The Intercept interviewed Francisco Cantu, a former Border Patrol agent, who told them, quote, I often heard romanticized stories of the old patrol, a lament for the days when agents had free reins across the borderlands, lighting abandoned cars on fire and tuning up smugglers and migrants at will. As young trainees, my colleagues and I were taken to storied places in the desert, a remote pass where earlier generations of agents were rumored to have pushed migrants from clifftops and hidden their corpses. A stretch of road where an agent had run over a Native American lying drunk and asleep in the road. An isolated patch of scrubland where agents had force-fed smugglers fistfuls of marijuana and turned them loose to rock through the wilderness barefoot and stripped to their underwear. There was a lot to digest there. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Dan. What does turning up mean? Tuning up. Tuning up. It means beating the shit out of. Oof. Yeah. Of course, as time went on, the Border Patrol became gradually more professional and somewhat less like a bunch of drunken sociopaths. Good. Less being Uh. the operative word, not... Unlike, and we're not going to talk enough about the number of people who are killed by Border Patrol every year. Mm-hmm. Some violence still persists, but it's it's obviously less than it was in the 20s. Sure. Just like we don't, 
you know, there's still problems with prescription drug yeah, companies, of, yeah. but we don't sell children morphine. Right. A lot of things are less than the 20s. Yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As a general rule. It doesn't make it okay. It yeah. doesn't make it okay. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> Literally almost a hundred yeah. years ago. Yeah. So the Border Patrol became less sociopathic, but the desire to fight immigration with hooliganry remained. Enter Lewis Beam. You guys ever heard of Lewis Beam? No. Oh, he is someone we will be talking about a lot in my upcoming audiobook, The War on Everyone, mm. because he's like, if George Lincoln Rockwell is like the George Washington of American fascism, sure. Uh, Lewis Beam is like the the Abraham Lincoln of Nazis. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I that actually does not scan at all. No. Uh, so I, I don't know why I, I said it, but I, I mean think I, I scanned know. it. Yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. He carried. You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Lewis Beam did an 18-month extended tour in Vietnam as a helicopter machine gunner. He saw extensive combat and spent roughly 1,000 hours shooting bullets at people, accounting for between 12 and 51 kills. When he came home, it was as a radicalized, far-right white nationalist with fervent anti-communist views. In the early 1970s, Beam created the Klan Border Watch, part of a new trend towards paramilitary training among the KKK. Beam stated at the time, when our government officials refuse to enforce the laws of the country, we will enforce them ourselves. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. That's what the, that's the, why the, that's, that's, the, why con- that's the Constitution. That's mm-hmm. what, yeah, that's the, uh, the, that's our God-given <laughs> right to take the law into our own hands. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if the government won't stop people who are critical to the infrastructure and economy of this nation from entering illegally because the legal pathways are a gigantic pain in the ass, then it's got to be up to the KKK to do it. Mm-hmm. That just it makes sense. That doesn't make me question um, any of uh, my feelings about immigration or immigrants or uh, <laughs> what people think about uh, getting rid of them. Yeah. I'll just take those two things at face value and uh, never think about it again. <laughs> You know what? You know what I love is never thinking about things again. Just never think about it again. Just never think about yeah. it again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's easier that way. Mm-hmm. It's way mm-hmm. easier that way. Now we're gonna, as I said, talk about Louis Beam so much more during the War on Everyone, my upcoming very fun audiobook that everyone's <laughs> going to love, find uplifting, and dare I say, shamefully erotic. Mm. But for the purposes of our story today, the tale of the Klan Border Watch has a lot more to do with two different and somewhat more comical racists. Tom Metzger and David Duke. Yeah, there it is. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, you knew David Duke knew was coming to this, this motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, Metzger was Beam's counterpart in the California Ku Klux Klan, and Duke was, well, we'll get to David Duke in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Anyway, here's how Bring the War Home by Kathleen Ballou describes the Klan Border Patrol. Quote, The patrols functioned both as a publicity stunt and as a way to inculcate real anti-immigrant hostility and encourage acts of violence. Some patrols worked as photo opportunities for the press. In one such incident, Duke and California KKK members hung Klan border watch signs on their cars and drove to the border near San Diego and Tijuana. When no undocumented immigrants appeared, Duke boasted to reporters, I think some Mexicans are afraid to enter the country because of the Klan. Mm -hmm. See, Mm -hmm. there's that deterrent working. There's that deterrent working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's, – because if if, – well, the KKK uh, being there didn't work. So, like, let's just uh, take your kids away. Yeah. <laughs> That's the next step. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then just it's like, a well, that doesn't work. Okay. That's a logical so, like, step. It doesn't work. Okay. Well, I guess, like, tear gas, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, that doesn't work. Next stop bullets. Next... Mm, I didn't want to think about it more. I was going to put that away. I wasn't going to, you know. Just not analyze that until yeah. the shooting starts. I honestly yeah, 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 can't yeah. even remember what you're talking about. Exactly. I put it away. Mm-hmm. There you go. You know what I'm about to put away? These throwing bags. Big old. Yeah. They really See, do that bounce bounces right, right, <laughs> right yeah, yeah, under yeah. my feet. I we got to stick with the throwing bagels. This this toss and dough bread is, is toss, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. toss and dough. Toss and dough doesn't work. What are you laughing at, Sophie? This is very important. I'm doing a very important podcast right now. <laughs> All right, nerd. <laughs> what if the toss and bread uh, company offered to sponsor this show? Um, you know, I have too much integrity. Oh, That's okay. what I like to hear. I mean, I'll let them sponsor the show, but I'm not going to lie and say that the tossing mm-hmm. bread is better than the throwing bagels. Exactly. You can't. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You, can't. you gotta you can't. be honest. Anyone can advertise as long as the truth can be told the, about it. The bread yes. is for... Curdled cream, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's and that's yeah. what we stand behind. I mean, it, it's I'll say this: it's more fun to throw the bread, but the bounce back is so much more satisfying Absolutely. on the on the toss and bagels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? What are you gonna do? That's I mean, I'm gonna throw the bagels a lot. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, four now, pumps, <clears throat> one cream. <laughs> I mean, we we could test that out. Let's not. Let's not. Mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> but let's do someday. Yeah, yes, one day. We, one when day. we when we inevitably do the drunk episode of this podcast, Ooh. we'll we'll figure out exactly how these relate to one of those little creamer packets you get in the Seven Eleven. In one year, when yeah. it's a year old, when, when it's, it's, a, it's a year old cream, we'll figure <laughs> that out. January yeah, yeah, twenty twenty. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <clears throat> So, uh, Tom Metzger and David Duke are both important figures in the development of the American fascist movement. But today I want to go into a little bit more detail about David Duke. He's been racist longer than most Americans have been alive. During the 1960s, when he was in high school, he was already an ardent white nationalist. When he went to college in 1969, he became a student organizer for the National Socialist White People's Party, a direct descendant of George Lincoln Rockwell's Nazi Party. Duke also started the White Student Alliance and the White Youth Alliance. He was particularly active in Louisiana State University's Free Speech Alley. Mm. According to Leonard Zeskin's Blood and Politics, quote, in one incident from those early years, Duke donned a Nazi stormtrooper uniform complete with swastika armband and strode around for the cameras with a picket sign protesting a campus speech by noted left-wing attorney William Kunzler. Free speech! I agree. Free speech. All of this checks out. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sounds like a real good conservative. Sounds like a real good guy. What if, um, let's say he and these people were to get a lot of power do you think that they would care about free speech yeah of course you think that they would they would defend free speech for people uh who maybe disagree with them um, you know no, no, that's that, not free speech cody I, free speech is my ability to talk about what i want i don't give a I don't, who who I don't taller care. about I was, someone else i was reading about a free speech activist a guy named Hitler, Hitler, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, in Germany. I think it's pronounced Hitler. Hitler, yeah, and he, he came mm -hmm. to power actually in in the early 1930s. Mm -hmm. I haven't read you know further in the book that I'm reading about him, but I, okay. I think he was a, a real free speech crusader. Well, well because whatever happened to one him? Then, yeah. I don't, you know, I, I, I haven't finished the book. I'll, okay. I'll get I'll get through it one of these days. Next time, okay. yeah, yeah it we sounds... can talk about Hitler. <laughs> The California Border Patrol was Duke's brain baby first and foremost, although Metzger handled most of the logistics. Blood and Politics describes the media campaign he crafted around these patrols, relating a press conference in October of 1977. David Duke stepped out of a rented helicopter and onto the grounds of the San Ysidro Port of Entry south of San Diego, a federal office used by the Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS, to regulate traffic on the border with Mexico. Dressed in a light blue business suit, Duke was surrounded by an entourage of tough-looking men in street clothes, all members of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. They faced a protest group, angry at the Klan's public appearance. An egg splattered on Duke's clothes, and a rock broke the windshield of a Klansman's car. Police arrested the rock thrower while an INS <laughs> agent in charge welcomed the Klansmen and gave them a guided tour of the mm -hmm. port facility. Mm -hmm. For Duke mm -hmm. and company, this visit was the first stop in an effort to stir up opposition to brown-skinned immigrants. We believe very strongly white people are becoming second-class citizens in this country, Duke told the press. When I think of America, I think of a white country. Honestly, that just makes it. We try to keep this light and fun, <laughs> yeah. but my blood boils a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel my shoulders inching up to my ears. I could, because you're angry at the uh, the anti-free speech people who tossed yes. a rock at that kind yes. of right. Yeah. You, you, you got me. Yeah. No one let him speak. Yeah. I mean, I think you're doing a great job because you're, you're, well, you're like relaying the message. Mm -hmm. but he's like these, speaking right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These rock throwers, these egg throwers. Mm -hmm. I, they might I, as well I, be shooting guns. They might as well <laughs> be shooting guns and should be treated as such. Also, what about those poor baby eggs? Those poor baby chickens? Exactly. That could have That's been a, murder. a third of an omelet. Um, yeah. Mm. As the uh, current president of the United States says, maybe we should treat them throwing rocks as if they were guns. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, because, you know, um, it, 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 when you toss a rock, that can that could go in a solid 15, 20 feet per second. Mm -hmm. And you know, a, 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 a rifle's only like three thousand feet per second. And it's not a, that it's not that different. What's a bullet but a tiny rock? Exactly. What's exactly. math but numbers? <laughs> you know, come on. Duke officially announced his Klan border watch several days later in Sacramento. He said 500 to 1,000 Klansmen would patrol the border crossings in areas in between the fences in search of illegal immigrants. The reality was less impressive. Less than 200 Klansmen actually showed up to drive around, and their activity at the border was limited to a few weeks. The Knights of Texas started patrolling their border at the same time, but in both cases, the border watches were more PR than practical. The Klan's newspaper, The Crusader, published a special article to commemorate this heroic action. No single action in the last decade has done more to bring public attention and awareness on the border problem. 
Now, it would be more accurate to state that no single action did more to bring public awareness to the cause of white nationalism. Focusing on the border and illegal immigration was a hugely successful PR move for America's most organized racists. As David Duke himself noted, when a hundred reporters are gathered around hanging on every word, when they help you accomplish your objectives by their own misguided sensationalism, if indeed it was a media stunt, it was by their own presence and admission that it was a very brilliant one. Mm -hmm. That's irrelevant to... Anything today? Yeah, no, it does not tie into. That's anything my favorite that's thing about recently. coming on this podcast because it's how like, irrelevant it is. To yeah, today. hearing hearing stories and stuff that has nothing to do with what's going on. Mm-hmm. Like, because I like to, you know, I, we read the news all the time. Mm-hmm. We talk about it all the time, mm-hmm. and so you want to shut that part of your brain off and, and talk you just about hear, things that never happened. You again. just want to hear stories that are like, eh, here's this random thing that happened. Yeah, that has that doesn't tie into anything else. Nothing. You know, it does tie in to <gasps> anything else. <gasps> Ads for products and services. Oh, yes. It might even be an ad for Sarah Lee Deluxe Throwing Bagels. Yeah! (laughs) They bounce right back. Products! We're back! Ooh. Just like these bagels were back after I threw them because they bounce right back, mm-hmm. which should be the tagline if the fucking Sara Lee people knew how yeah. to advertise a product. Are you listening, Hire a Sarah, Sarah Lee. Bagel. I can sell some motherfucking bagels. Ba- they bounce ba- right back. They bounce right back. Bagel rings. <laughs> bagel rings. Oh, good. I love it. We've got another I, career I, I trajectory <laughs> blooming in this room. Yeah, this, this feels more organic than pitching Doritos. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Because I love tossing bagels. Yeah. <clears throat> Even more than you love I mean, burritos? That can be a euphemism so. for a lot of things, too. Tossing bagels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oof. Yep. Mm-hmm. My mind went places. Yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah. Especially <laughs> if you're a fan of bagel salad, as I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Chopped yeah. up bagel bagels salad. And, a, and, a, and a chicken stir fry salad. And with, a coffee mate. <laughs> a little drizzle. bit of coffee mate. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the cream. It's a reduction in the it's salad mwah. cream. Ew. <laughs> this is. Disgusting. I've been on this podcast a lot. This is the worst thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about stuff that's even worse. Cool. <clears throat> so, while David Duke and Lewis Beam were content to mostly use the question of le- illegal immigration to drum up interest in their super cool clubs, other Americans <clears throat> remained frustrated by the fact that no actual action had been taken to stop migrants from coming over. Enter Civilian Materiel Assistance or the CMA. The CMA was founded in 1983 by a wholesale grocer from Arizona who wanted to provide aid to anti-communist guerrillas fighting in Nicaragua. This aid eventually (laughs) turned into actual volunteer fighters, several of whom died in that country. Kathleen Ballou notes that, quote, in Nicaragua, CMA acted covertly on behalf of the U.S. government. It was funded by the CIA and supplied by the U.S. military. Cool. That's that good shit, yeah. Now, the 1980s were a time in which a lot of civil wars were raging all across Latin America. Most of those wars were funded and in some way supported by the CIA and the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. For example, also during this period, the Guatemalan government was fighting an insurgency. They dumped suspected guerrilla fighters into the ocean out of helicopters so no one would find their bodies and disrupt the military aid they received from the United States. All this violence and unrest across the region led a lot of people to flee their homes and search for a better, less violent life in the United States. The CMA was not a fan of this. Mm -hmm. According to The Intercept, quote, In the summer of 1986, approximately 20 heavily armed men in military fatigue stepped into the darkness of the Arizona desert. It was July 4th weekend outside the remote border town of Lochiel, and the gunmen were on the hunt, carrying M16s and AK-47s with Israeli night vision goggles strapped to their heads. The vigilantes soon found what they were looking for, two carloads of Mexican nationals. J.R. Hagen, the crucifix-wearing Vietnam veteran who led the operation, would later say that the vehicles came to a stop on their own. Other members of his team disagreed, telling reporters that they booby-trapped the road, tearing the tire of one of the vehicles to shreds before opening fire. It was the latest in a series of escalating CMA actions, which had also included clandestine forays into Mexico. The, the militia members held 16 men, women, and children at gunpoint for an hour and a half before Border Patrol agents arrived to take them away. Very big discrepancies in their story. I, I love that they're they're protecting the U.S. border by invading Mexico. Unbelievable. And it's fine. Uh. It's like, it's like almost like people... These hyper masculine people, they need this a war to be fighting. They need to have some like battle that mm-hmm. they're planning. And it's, I get it. I, I like guns. That's why uh, I we would, have football. I, I, I get the, the desire to LARP with a fucking AR 15. Go do it on your friend's land and shoot at old cars. Don't fuck with people's lives and shoot their vehicles. Play a video game. Play a fucking video, Play game. A video, video game. game. Yeah. Uh, 
Unbelievable. Laser tag. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, like go fuck up another country, and then when they come yeah. here, yeah. stop them. Uh, <laughs> oh no, with guns. <laughs> yeah. um, I love because <laughs> it's really. I was like, okay, it's one guy said that they stopped on their own, but they disagreed, mm-hmm. and I was waiting for you, like, no, they stopped. They like held up guns. Yeah. They stopped the car. No, no, they booby <laughs> trapped the road. Trapped the road. No, 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 no. We like, we like put shit down. Yeah. <laughs> we weren't just standing what in the middle of the road. What do they think this is? Uh, they do awful. want a war zone. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, they want a war. They want a civil war. They, they want a revolution. There's a what uh, Hannity's old website. In like 2009, there are all these polls of like, what revolution do you prefer? Yeah, and it's like, civ- I want a civil war. No, I want like, uh, rev- like re- revolt against the government. Just like all these different options. One, yeah, there's one thing they want. They have all those cool toys, and they want an excuse to use them. Mm-hmm. So nobody voted for the industrial revolution. Mm. No. Oh man, mm. that was no. my favorite. I don't think it was like, an what's your favorite re- revolution? <laughs> I, I just, I just, you know what, I, you know what I love is little. little Cute little tykes working in factories. Mm-hmm. That just, I yeah, love Yeah, that. that really gets me. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, like, the key word is cute. It's yeah, cute. It's mm-hmm. cute. What oh, do they think my they God. are, adults? When their little hands, they go into those grain threshers and they mm-hmm. just try mm-hmm. to pull the stuff out faster than it can cut their fingers off. It's a fun it's game. so cute. Wholesome. Well, oh, adult hands wouldn't be able to do that. No, they wouldn't. And they'd be less cute. And it would be less cute. Oh, my God. In there. The little, the little cute little fake limbs for mm-hmm. them, the little peg legs and stuff Aww, when they lose yeah, their legs yeah. in the threshers. I like their, uh, the, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> that cough that, like, that little black, that little black oh, lung. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, think of how little those black lungs are, too. Mm-hmm. It's adorable. Itty bitty. Mm. I love a good like, revolution. Like little licorice jelly beans in their, mm-hmm. in their chest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Aw, that's mm. so cute. Yeah. You took it too far. <laughs> yeah, you did. You really did. <laughs> jelly beans are cute. What's no, up? you know what? Yeah. Ooh, oh, shit. Oh! <laughs> yep, it hit Katie's the mic. The are mine. <laughs> if I throw it out the other wall, will it what do you, bounce what do you, back what to you? What, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what is that expression, Sophie? I just had a t-shirt idea to T-Public that was like a protester throwing something, <laughs> but instead of it being like fire, yeah. it's a throwing bagel. Oh, Absolutely. that's a great idea. That's a great do you want one. your bagels back? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, instead of a Molotov. It's a, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Molotov cocked bagel. I love so that. Bagel. The There's something here. Also, Molotov <laughs> locks to uh, uh, something. We're close. We're getting there. We're getting there. I'm proud of you guys. Yeah. I'm, I'm proud of all of us. We'll probably cut some of that out. <laughs> 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 Dan says no, sir. Yeah. Nope. 1991 was an important year for America's political racists. It's the year David Duke ran for governor of Louisiana. He lost, but he won almost 39% of the popular vote, which is a lot of votes. That's the magic number. <laughs> yeah. It's like that, like, that range. Yeah. There's always that range of people who, who will are, vote support for this a kind of thing. Like the yes. president's current approval rating. <laughs> hey, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that I don't know who you're talking about or who you're talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was also the year of the Gulf War, and many of America's white supremacists were very much against that war happening. Mm. The Populist Party was founded by Willis Carto in 1984. Willis will get an episode himself, but the short of it is he was modern America's first successful intellectual Nazi. Think of him as as the Richard Spencer of the 1980s and 90s. He kept his power level just wrapped up enough to avoid being tarred with the same brush as George Lincoln Rockwell, but he shared Rockwell's ultimate goal, uniting the American right behind white supremacist politics. The Populist Party was a major early vehicle for David Duke's political career. In 1991, they picketed and protested the Gulf War. Blood and Politics cites one of the leaflets they handed out by the hundreds. Quote, If the Populist Party were in power, we would have hundreds of thousands of troops on the Mexican border, not in desert desert sand dunes 10,000 miles away. There would be no affirmative action, quotas, or other anti-white racist schemes. Anti-white racist schemes. That's my... Oh, God. You're like waiting for like no more wars. Uh, no, 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 just not. We're we want it no. closer. We want to do we're, it closer. We want a war on those unarmed like, right, right, right. people trying to cross the border. Got to kill those women and children. Got to shoot those we women and children. To, we want to be able to see the, the war from our backyard. Yeah. I want to be, be able to go partake in the war is. if I want to. I want a war, but I also don't want to have to go too far from a kitchen. Well, you don't want to have to fight a war in like a gross foreign country. No. You know, you want to no, do it here. I want, to, I want to kill some people. I want to go home to my own bed. Exactly. America exactly. first. Mm-hmm. War here. <laughs> yeah. Forever. <laughs> yeah, import, don't export. Exactly, war. exactly, exactly, exactly. We've got a war deficit, <laughs> yeah. trade-wise. Yeah, the war gap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> By 1992, 
or in 1992, Pat Buchanan ran in the Republican Party primary against mm-hmm. George H.W. Bush. So did Tom Metzger, for that matter. Buchanan made border security the keystone issue of his campaign. During a press event at the border in May, he told the L.A. Times, quote, I am calling attention to a national disgrace. The failure of the national government of the United States to protect the borders of the United States from an illegal invasion that involves at least a million aliens a year. As a consequence of that, we have social problems and economic problems and drug problems. Oh. Unfortunately for Pat, Tom Metzger showed up at the border that same day, intent on attacking Pat Buchanan from the right. Here's how Blood and Politics relates what happened next. The only problem was Metzger, who waited with great fanfare for Buchanan to appear. Where was the great white hope, he sneered like a perfect villain in a street theater. I want to talk with him. When Buchanan finally did appear, he was forced to huddle in a small circle of supporters to avoid contact with Metzger. But the ornery Aryan worked his way into camera range nevertheless. Pat, he yelled as all the cameras swung away from the candidate and toward him. What are we going to do about all those rich Republicans making millions off the wetbacks in the Imperial Valley? As the cameras swung back and forth, Buchanan beat a hasty retreat after less than 15 minutes of photoless opportunity. With the cameras all to himself, Metzger then staged his own press conference. If he were president, he argued volubly, he would station national guard troops like a picket fence along the border with orders to shoot to kill. The immigration problem would be over in one night, he declared. Yes. Wrong. Cool. That's, Wrong. Uh, but yeah. also cool. cool. But also gross. Mm-hmm. Um, but also gross. That's, uh, yeah, that's it's always fascinating. Yeah. Hearing, hearing current stories. <laughs> like, um, a, like a picket fence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But just like, yeah, that... Uh, a that beautiful ar- fence. With yeah. guns. A gun fence. Pat Buchanan from the right. It's yeah. Very, that's, yeah. That's a thing. That's a feat, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, all right, okay, feat. okay. It's like, uh, like, I've seen that conversation happen online many, many yeah. times, but just like, oh, yeah, two, like, candidates are mm-hmm. doing their... Mm-hmm. Their Twitter, their Twitter argument, but in real life, yeah, and pulling mm. them to the right. This is mm-hmm. what we had to do before Twitter: was mm-hmm. show up at the 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 border and shout at each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, obviously, the 1992 election did not go to any Republican. Slick Willie, noted lawyer and probable rapist, won. In the mid-1990s, Clinton's Border Patrol launched the Prevention Through Deterrence campaign. This basically focused the Border Patrol in several specific border cities in an attempt to funnel migrants into the Sonoran Desert by basically blocking off all of the easy ways into the country. The idea was that migrants would realize there were no safe routes into the United States and thus stop trying to enter. I mean, I'm sure that worked. Seems seems like people fleeing war and in some cases literal genocide in their homes would be stopped by crossing an additional desert. Right. Desperation and the human drive for survival mm-hmm. is easily deterred. Yeah. Yes. It very, very easily uh, deterred. By like a, a single extra obstacle. Exactly. Yeah. That isn't necessarily a worse obstacle than ones they've already uh, gotten Just through. That's a key way one. to get people to stop trying mm-hmm. to do something. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> It's like go well, through hell and be like, what about hell light? <laughs> yeah, what um, about a slightly uh, less worse? Anyway, yeah. let's read the next paragraph. <laughs> oh, no! Uh, It turns out thousands of migrants tried to cross and hundreds of them died in the Sonoran Desert. In many cases, they died due to lack of water, heat stroke, and all the other terrible things that can happen to a body whilst traveling through the desert on foot. But a number of those migrants, we will never know how many, died violently. In 2000, Eusebio de Haro, a Mexican man, was shot to death by Texas landowner Sam Blackwood. Eusebio had asked Sam for water. Blackwood was convicted of a misdemeanor deadly conduct charge and fined $4,000. Several members of the jury hugged members of his family after the verdict was given. All of this, finally, brings me to the Minutemen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're like me, the Minutemen Civil Defense Corps were the first vigilante border militia you ever heard about. Yes. They started in April of 2005 as the brainchild of a man named Chris Simcox. Now, Chris was born in 1961. His childhood occurred while David Duke was wearing a swastika in Free Speech Alley and Lewis Beam was machine gunning people in Vietnam. In his early years, Chris's life gave little hint that he would follow down an even vaguely similar path to those men. He moved out to L.A. with dreams of becoming an actor. After several years of failure, he became a kindergarten teacher instead and taught at the Wildwood School for 13 years. What? I just like... (laughs) I don't like where this is going. <laughs> you're, you're really not going to like where this is going, Cody. <laughs> By September 11th, 2001, he transitioned to running a private tutoring business. According to The Nation, quote, He appeared to suffer a mental breakdown in the days after the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks, refusing to communicate with anyone unless they first recited the preamble to the U.S. Constitution what? and leaving a series of bizarre messages on his ex-wife's answering machine about stockpiling weapons. I'm going on a great adventure, Simcox told his son three weeks after the attacks. Uh... 
This doesn't end well. <laughs> adventures you don't think are good. Well? Adventures are fun. Yeah, adventures are fun. I've, I've never, I love adventures. I've never heard of a bad adventure. Adventures mm-hmm. or Avengers? Adventures. Mm-hmm. Adventures. Adventures. Av- Avengers? Mm-hmm. Both are fun. Both are fun. Um, and nobody dies in, in either, either of them. That's my favorite thing about adventure mm-hmm. is the never dying part. Yep. This adventure was Chris moving out to Tombstone, Arizona, and getting a gig as a fake gunfighter and a local show for tourists. His dreams are coming true. <laughs> his dreams are coming okay, true. So this is going to be fun. This All is right, going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Okay. Be fun. He also sunk some of his savings into buying the Tombstone Tumbleweed, a small local paper. Chris changed its editorial direction from local news to ranting violently about immigrants. Yeah. The next year, 2002, he founded the Tombstone Militia, which his own newspaper described as a committee of vigilantes. <laughs> the Tombstone Militia started patrolling the border irregularly. In January 2003, Chris was arrested for Wait, illegally... Like, I like, infrequently or we like, like weirdly? We, <laughs> both, actually. Like, we do it literally sometimes. Both. Yeah. That's, that's how you we find wear, success. We wear duck costumes. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't do it that often, yeah. so... <laughs> in 2003, Chris was arrested for illegally carrying a firearm in a national park during one of these missions. The nation notes, also in his possession, were a police scanner and a toy figure of Wyatt Earp riding a horse. Yeah. So it is weirdly, it's, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, everything's adding up. Yeah. In April of 2005, Chris teamed up with Jim Gilchrist, a retired accountant in Orange County, to start the Minuteman Project. According to Chris, citizen border patrols were needed to do the job the government refuses to do and protect the country from people he called mm. invaders. Mm. Mm. I, that's a new word. All of this is new. <laughs> Not the same wor- language that Lewis Beam, the Nazi, used to justify the Klan border patrol a couple of decades earlier. Very totally different. Not uh, the same word. Identical language. Yeah, yeah, not the same word that any of these people use, or the uh-huh. president specifically, or the Christchurch shooter, or mm-hmm. uh, I could. I, do, should I keep? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, should I keep? Yeah, you keep. Keep, wait, I, no, 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 no. You, you know what? You I'll just, I'll just. You know what? Actually, this one. You want to throw these bagels in anger? At that one? Wherever you want. Okay, you throw you those toss, bagels. You toss those bagels. Nothing in here can be damaged. And oh, this is a solid still, toss. They, they, still they still bounce come. back. They still it all back. bounces back to Robert. And the invasion is over. Does this play well on podcasts? Oh yeah, people love people <laughs> mm-hmm. love a, a good a good bagel throw. It's the uh, cornerstone of my show. Mm-hmm. The Minuteman project lasted a month, and it mostly involved vol- uh, groups of volunteers sitting in lawn chairs near the border, <laughs> looking for migrants with binoculars. While it was unimpressive on the ground, the Minuteman project was a huge PR success. Fox paid particular attention, but coverage spanned the gamut of mainstream news sources. I found an NBC News article from June 2005, about two months after the Minutemen's first outing. Quote, Headlines from the Arizona event gave the group momentum and turned what some believed to be nothing more than a publicity stunt into a national movement. The group has since hired lawyers, reorganized into separate corporations, filed to legally protect the name Minuteman Project, hired a Washington-based media consultant, and started an aggressive fundraising campaign. And representatives of the group have been to Washington to lobby Congress and relate the lessons learned from their time on the border. So, uh, unless the work continues, it's just going to be viewed as a dog and pony show, said James Gilchrist, one of the Minutemen leaders, when the Arizona Project wrapped up. He and Simcox unabashedly acknowledged that among their chief considerations in Arizona was getting media attention. Mm -hmm. So, if you know one thing about the kind of people who create volunteer militias, it's that they're all impossible assholes who hate each other. (laughs) Simcox and Gilchrist did not get along. And less than a month after blowing up, you know, Press wise, the Minuteman Project. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's like, yeah, wait, yeah, did yeah. we skip part? Yeah. All right. I, I'm hungover again, so I'm, I'm reading some of this <laughs> like a sh- shithead. Huh. Uh, less than a month after blowing up in the news, the Minuteman fractured into two separate groups. Gilchrist created Minuteman Inc., an organization aimed at fighting illegal immigration inside the U.S. by attacking employers violating immigration laws. Simcox ran the Minuteman Civil Defense Corps, or MCDC. On paper, the two groups were part of the same larger whole. In reality, they had fairly little to do with each other. This worked out great for Chris Simcox because it meant he could solicit donations directly to his group without sharing with Gilchrist. By August of 2006, between 60,000 and 130,000 people had donated money to fund the MCDC's operations. Chris Simcox claimed that he'd received over $1.6 million. He claimed at that point to have more than 7,451 casa migrantes, or migrant hunters, Mm. in his personal army. He claims these men had personally delivered 13,000 illegal aliens to the Border Patrol. Simcox and Gilchrist quickly gained the attention of powerful forces within the American right. According to The Nation... Quote, 
The cannonball media splash that followed attracted the attention of Diner Consultants. The Chicago-based political consulting and fundraising operation is run by Philip Sheldon, son of the Traditional Values Coalition, long one of the nation's most vociferous anti-gay crusaders. Diner is one cog in Philip Sheldon's revenue-generating machine, which also includes Response Unlimited, a direct mail firm promoted as the nation's best and most comprehensive source of mailing lists for conservative and Christian mailers and telemarketers, and perhaps best known for ghoulishly purchasing a list of donors to Terry Schiavo's legal fund from her parents several days before her death. Hmm. Cool. Cool. Very, That's cool. Very cool. You know what is even cooler? Another mailing list that Response Unlimited would happily sell to the highest bidder was a list of people who had subscribed to a now dead magazine called The Spotlight. You guys ever heard of The Spotlight? I've heard of Spotlights. Yeah. Uh, well, The Spotlight uh, is a literal neo Nazi news rag that mostly oh. focused on denying the Holocaust. Sure. It was sure. published by Willis Carto, founder of the Populist Party and backer of David Duke. So Chris Simcox was happy to sell access to his mailing list to these these people. It all checks out. Cool. Um, the the um, didn't care for the Nazi stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't oh, you care didn't? for uh, didn't care for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought you would have liked that part. Not not a fan of uh, referring to them as migrant hunters. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's um, pretty pretty bold. Really, that really made me so oh, much. Mm-hmm. It didn't. Um, can I just say like all of the above? Yeah, <laughs> you can say that. That's... I'm not a fan of migrant hunting either. Mm-hmm. You know what I am a fan of? Products. products. I love products. Services. services? Oh my gosh. You, I didn't know services now, would be included. before we go out to ads, I'm going to try tossing something I've never tossed. Yeah. And this might be an objectively bad idea. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm throwing the We're coffee mate. We're see what happens. <laughs> this, there's, oh, there's no way to know what's going to happen. One toss all the cream. <laughs> it was fine. It's safe. Everything's good. Everything's fine. Nothing. Uh, pardon. Only because I bapped it away. <laughs> pardon the language, but nothing came out. <laughs> but if what, you pardon? want I'm offended. something to come out, the product. <laughs> We're back! God, God. I, those ads. Oh, I love them. I, I, bought, I bought it all. I'm mm-hmm. so full from those ads. Mm. So am I. So am I. You know, let's, let's, let's fill our heads now with yeah. some, some knowledge. Let's some digest no- yeah. some things. Mm-hmm. Some okay. knowledge bites. Okay. So, uh, we were talking about Response Unlimited, people who buy up all the mailing lists. They bought the right. Minuteman's mailing list, or essentially uh, Chris Simcox sold access to that. Uh, the nation actually f- managed to find out some of the people who purchased access to the Minuteman's mailing list. It included Judge Roy Moore for his failed gubernatorial <laughs> campaign, Oliver North's Freedom Alliance, and some organization called Stop Puerto Rico Statehood. Uh, Jesus what Christ. The fudge. Yeah. They, they know they're fucking... Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Uh Data. Cool. (laughs) Yeah. Now, most new grifters in Chris Simcox's position would have fucked everything up within six months or less of their first grift going viral. But Chris is a smart dude. On April 19th, 2006, he showed up on Fox News' Hannity and Combs. He stated, with zero evidence, that 300,000 Middle Easterners had been apprehended entering the country in the last year. This is a clear and present danger. It is the greatest threat to national security and public safety. The time for negotiating is over. He then delivered an ultimatum to President George W. Bush. (laughs) Declare a state of emergency and deploy the National Guard and military reserves, or by Memorial Day weekend, we're going to break ground and we're going to start helping landowners to build a double-layer security fence along their properties. Thus was born Fencegate. Okay. Okay, okay. Cool. President Bush was forced to send 6,000 National Guard troops to the border to placate the Fox-watching crowd. Chris used the media storm around this to solicit even more donations. His plan was to buy up miles of private land along the border and build what he called an Israeli-style security fence, including a six-foot trench and concertina wire on top. By May 9th, just a few weeks after his Fox appearance, the fence had raised $175,000. A month later, almost $400,000 had been donated. Week by week... The Minuteman grew more and more tightly woven into the Republican establishment. In mid-2006, it was absorbed into the Declaration Alliance, a group formed by conservative activist Alan Keyes in 1996 to fight abortion and gay rights. The alliance's president, Mary Lewis, was a former assistant to Bill Kristol, editor of the now-defunct Weekly Standard. During a Minuteman gathering, Keyes told the assembled militiamen, What we're doing here is not just building a fence. We are rebuilding a character. We are redefining a people. 
Now, in every press appearance and interview, Simcox has been careful to note that the Minutemen were nonviolent. When Alan oh. Combs, Fox's now dead pocket Democrat, questioned Chris about the fact that some Minutemen carried guns on patrol, Chris told him, Alan, this is a dangerous place. There are drug dealers. Our group in California yesterday came across some drug mules, one of them carrying an AR-15. You know, our volunteers, thank God for the Second Amendment, are allowed to defend their lives if they're attacked. And when they put themselves in this dangerous situation, the same as the men and women of Border Patrol, they have that right. Okay. Mm. The reality of the situation is that Chris Simcox, Jim Gilchrist, and many of their volunteers were champing at the bit for an excuse to murder brown people. I'm going to play an audio clip from documentary footage shot in 2004. The first person we're going to hear is Gilchrist. I ought to be able to shoot the Mexicans on sight, and that would end the problem. After two or three Mexicans are shot, they'll stop crossing the border, and they'll take their cows home, too. What? And here's Simcox. I feel that the people that are coming across invading this country. I think they should be treated as, as enemies of the state. We need to start putting them in uh, work camps. Anyone could have walked through this, the borders of this country bringing uh, bombs, chemicals, weapons of mass destruction. I think they should be shot on sight, personally. Yeah, you know all those migrants bringing weapons of mass destruction? Yeah, you know, I, I, I looked into it because I wanted to know how many uh, terrorists, Al-Qaeda guys, have, mm-hmm. have snuck into America through the southern border. It's uh, it's still zero. It's still zero. Yeah, I but was wondering it, if it was still it's, zero. It's only been eighteen years. Yeah. You're so fingers right. crossed yeah. that changes. No, yeah, you're I, saying it's zero yeah. now. Exactly. Eighteen years after people started but worrying about it. You mm-hmm. never know. Um, it's interesting uh, hearing all these people talk um, and say these terrible things that uh, uh, many of our public officials say and and now do and now do like the camps <laughs> um like the camps uh like insinuating that maybe we should shoot them but we won't but we, maybe we, maybe we, we should. should we won't but we should it, it, would, be, cool it, would, be it would be effective it'd be effective yeah we, did. we won't but we, but we will work i also like yeah the deterrent mm-hmm. that'll deter them it's and and that's what gilchrist said that like if you start you only have to kill a few and it'll deter them mm-hmm. that's literally the same thing nazi tom metzger said 30 years earlier yeah, yeah. that you, you start killing a few and it'll stop it yeah yeah. Um, yeah. It's important to note that the Minutemen, although they wrapped themselves in more moderate garb and were very tightly woven into the Republican Party, were just as hateful and had intentions just as violent as the neo Nazis and Klansmen who preceded them. Yeah, you know how like people are talking about like Donald Trump and how like he's yeah. like, ah, oh, look at look what he's doing to everybody, look what he's doing to the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's interesting how it's less that and more he, he he's, just he's, up an, the he's an expression of it. He's he's, he's he's just the DJ. They were already dancing. He's like but the, he got um, up and he pumped up the fucking. He's volume. the one pump one cream to their rhetoric. Like, yes, he's the if I may borrow a name, the spotlight. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. nice. Uh, maybe a little bit. Lots nice. Of, lots of tie-ins here. Yeah. So yes, the men and men uh, wrapped themselves in the notion of protecting America, but what they really wanted was an excuse to murder Hispanics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In part two, we're going to talk about what happened when some of them finally got that chance. Great. But first, but I don't wanna... <laughs> plugs. Oh yeah. P zone. We <laughs> the, the P zone. What well, the P zone? I mean, it's you guys. You guys plug your stuff. Drop it. Drop a P in the P zone. Look, we're here. We're here on the podcast a lot. You like that? Mm-hmm. Uh, we got our own podcast called Even More News. Yo. Cody, you do the rest. I, there's also a YouTube show called Some More News on uh, the videos, and my Twitter is Dr. Mr. Cody, and my uh, the show's Twitter is Some More News, and Katie's Twitter is Katie Stoll. That's right. I have a Twitter. Uh, I, I'm I'm I write okay on Twitter. You you can follow me there if you want to be my friend or my enemy. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'm taking both. Uh, I have there's t-shirts you can buy on T Public. You can find this podcast on on Twitter or the Gram at at Bastards Pod. You can find all of the sources for this episode on BehindTheBastards.com. Uh, I don't think I have any other podcasts to plug. Sophie, is that correct? You're just looking like you're angry at me. <laughs> Like you're like furious. Uh-oh. Am, I, am I missing something? Oh, do you want me to throw the bagels again? Okay, I'm gonna throw the bagels again. Oh, oh knocked over Katie's drink. <laughs> they are getting yeah. progressively more dangerous. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not gonna stop. Why would you? Why would you stop? Nothing, nothing, nothing terrible has happened yet. Exactly. So, just keep going. Keep going. <laughs> That's some America logic. Mm-hmm. Speaking of America, I have a podcast about what if civil war called it could happen here. Spoilers. It's terrible. <laughs> 
I mean, the podcast is good, but the, yeah, the, the uh, yeah, I hope so. Anyway, the episode's over. Go throw some bagels, hug a cat, give a cat bagels. We're done. Make a bagel song. Episode's over.